but you've definitely found your niche like you with <laughs> like new adult and fantasy and that you've got great voice like it's it's really enjoyable to listen to like i'm listening to it and i'm like this is such a great story like this is so good and then i'm like oh wait i wrote it <laughs> <laughs> wow storytelling feels so real like you can imagine what's going on as you're reading it which uh lo- that's a gift for for narrators if they can bring the story to life that isn't just reading a story that you know like if i'm out walking and i've got my airpods in and i can listen to the story and i'll be like no and people <laughs> around, the dog starts barking i'm like oh no no it's okay you know? welcome back inside my wardrobe which i converted into a recording studio and a lot of the work i do in here is narration of audiobooks and one of the authors I work with in fact I've done more books for her than anybody else so far is W.J. May I know her as Juanita although up until this chat that you're about to see we'd never actually even spoken all the communication was messaging through the ACX site and emails and I've done some terrific books for her but there is one series which is going really well and I love it it's the Royal Factions series and book one is available now it's a fantasy but there's some real dark parts to it too anyway we talk about that and we start with how I got to do the books I'm smiling because although she did like my audition I know I got the gig because of Liverpool Football Club Anyway, we explain all. It was great to meet her. She's an amazing lady with an amazing story. And this is my chat with W.J. May. And stick around because you can get a free download of the audiobook and find out how a little bit later on in the chat. This is me and Juanita. I mean W.J. May. We are going to talk about the book. Of course. <laughs> but but we should mention a big thanks to to Jejan uh, Lovren for bringing us together. Really. Oh, yeah. The Liverpool player <laughs> because this is what happened. I auditioned for for one of your books and you must have checked me out somehow and you noticed a, a tweet a tweet I sent. Well, you were vetting me, were you? Yeah. <laughs> And you noticed a tweet I sent because I had one of the best nights ever in 2016 in the quarterfinal of the UEFA Cup, Liverpool versus Dortmund. I was in town because I did six weeks filling in on the breakfast show at BBC Radio Merseyside. And this was the the Thursday night and the Friday was going to be the last day of my six-week stint. I'd had a great time. And I went to the match and you probably remember the match, but... um, we were we were going out of the UEFA Cup and it was injury time and I was right in the middle of the cop about halfway up and Lovren headed this goal in and the place just went crazy and it was just a great night. So I sent him a message saying when I heard he was leaving the club just thanking him for a great night <laughs> and, and you saw that and then decided, yeah, I'm the guy you want to produce and narrate the audio book. <laughs> Anybody who's a Liverpool fan is is number one in my box. <laughs> so so tell me your connection to Liverpool Football Club then. Why are you a fan all that way in Canada? Um, my husband is actually from Liverpool and his whole family's there. So they're all in, uh, 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 yeah, in Liverpool. Everyone lives in the area. He's the only one who's come here. But we met actually in school down in the States. So I was a foreigner. He was the foreigner. So we kind of hung out and... It was actually really funny. One of the first times we talked, he asked where I was from, and I was like, oh, it's a little town in in Ontario by Niagara Falls. And when I mentioned it, he's like, I actually think I have family that live there. <laughs> so it's really funny. I believe it's his mom's uncle that had moved to Canada and immigrated and lived in the area where we were. No. So it was kind of, yeah, it was really, really interesting connection in that sense. But so, yeah, we're here. His family's in Liverpool. We've got, you know, our son's room is decked out in LFC like there's no tomorrow. <laughs> right. It's good. And uh, we're, we're, what's his name? Uh, my husband is Chris May. And and whereabouts in Liverpool is Chris from? He's from um, Gattaca. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, Old Gatwick is quite nice, actually. It yeah. Is. Yeah, isn't it? They're in a beautiful, his parents have a beautiful home there, and his um, his brother is in Hillwood. That yeah, sense, yeah, by the by the car plant, yeah, and then yeah. the airport, yeah, not too far from there. And then um, his sister is now in Witness. They bought a new place down in Witness. So, yeah, yeah. It's, Witness. It's... My connection to Witness is, I mean, I know Witness, but um, my what my wife's from New Zealand, and I met her in New Zealand. And See, we, same story. <laughs> well, I met I met Julie. Actually, we've been married thirty three years. Tomorrow is our wedding anniversary. Thirty three oh, years. Happy anniversary. We 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 <laughs> met in in New Zealand, and we wondered where to get married, and we were we we're having a day out in a place called the Bay of Islands, and in the Bay of Islands in Pai here, there's a stone church right on the waterfront, which is unusual in New Zealand because most of the buildings there are wooden. And I said, it'd be really nice to get married in there. And Julie said, well, we're not from this area. We, we don't know anyone. We don't go to church there. We're, well, we don't go to church, <laughs> but we don't, we don't know anyone. Surely you have to be from the parish to get married in that church. And I said, well, I'm going to ask them. And I kind of wrote down the phone number. And I rang the, the phone number that was on the board. And the lady who was the reverend that ran the place was from Witness. From Witness. <laughs> What are the chances? And she married us. We got married on the other side of the world by a lady from Witness. So yeah. she came to New Zealand for the wedding? No, then. she was living in New Zealand. Oh, she okay. was the lady who ran the church. And she, uh, yeah, and my parents came out for the wedding and, and, and that was it. It was, it was, and now my grandmother's ashes are actually in the grounds of that church, which is no another way. story. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's my connection right. to Witness. Yeah. <laughs> Hilarious. See, the world just gets smaller and smaller. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So let's talk about you then. So you grew up in, in this little town near Niagara Falls. What's it called? It's called St. Catharines. Yeah. And, and yeah, no, I'm one of six. Uh, I'm the end of six. I have four brothers and a sister. And we all played sports. We all had schooling here kind of thing. And ironically, there's six of us and we all live in the area. Which Still. Which is unbelievable. Yes, we're all within 20 minute driving distance of each other. Now, being. I mean, we all still like each other. <laughs> you what? We all still like each other. Which is, well, that's quite an achievement. Yeah. <laughs> and so, being the youngest of the six, is that what made you so competitive, do you think? I think so. I'm not sure. I mean, we're all pretty competitive, we all love sports. Um, Brothers played hockey. All, all, we all played football. Like we all played soccer and that. And I just, yeah, I started high jumping when I was 16, and it was just, you know, it was part of school activities, another sport to play, and it just went really, really well. And before I knew it, by the end of that summer, I was jumping, let's see, six feet, so 182, 183, 1.83 meters, I guess. And and how was, tall are you? I'm one meter seventy, so five seven. So you were jumping, what, about an extra 20 centimeters taller yeah. than you are from, from the ground? Yes, you got it. Let's see. Yeah, my PB is 20, uh, 22 centimeters over my head. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I, you you I did, couldn't do that now. <laughs> no, but you did hold a Canadian record. Do you still hold that? I do. I have the Canadian junior record in Canada, and I have a couple of provincial records and stuff, and... It was really fun. Uh, last spring, I was nominated into the St. Catharines Hall of Fame for sports. So that was, we had a night out. This is all pre-COVID, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So was it the the athletics? Because it was, all, it, I mean, high jumping was your speciality, but track and field was what you did. Was it the athletics that took you to the United States to study? It, yes. So when I graduated high school, um, I had jumped six, three and a half, so 192. And at that time, it was number two in the world for juniors. So there was, wow. yeah, so, yeah, so I was really, really lucky. I kind of had my choice of where I wanted to go and that. And there's a great high jump coach and a jumps coach down in Kansas. So I signed down there. I'd done it a year in Canada at University of Toronto. And then I thought, why am I paying for school when I could get it for free? <laughs> right, yeah, on a scholarship, so, yeah. Yeah, so I headed down, and um, I did my first year, and then the second year over through the semester, Chris had come down. He had been running um, in England for Liverpool Harriers, and then he had come down on a scholarship. He was a distance runner, an 8 and 15 meter, 
1500 meter runner and we just yeah we met hung out got an education and came back to canada right and the, the rest Bob, is history Bob too. <laughs> yeah so do you get over to liverpool very often to see his family i know you've been but do you, do you get over very often um we not as much as we'd like but we do when we before we had kids we came over two or three times a year oh wow you, that's a lot yeah, yeah. pop over and you, you know, a couple of years, 10 years ago, you could find a last minute flight for pretty cheap. And I remember one year we flew in on Christmas Day and uh, we didn't tell his parents. And I still remember his dad, Ronnie, come at the top of the stairs while we knocked on the door. And he's like, I recognize that coat. I recognize that <laughs> coat. So, wow. we went, so Chris's parents were married um, 50 years last March. So yeah. we were over in March. We took, so the kids had come when they were smaller. But our youngest hadn't been yet, and she just turned 10. So this was the first time she had come. So she, we, we made a good trip of it and saw as much as we could in the 10 days we were over. And hopefully, barring any COVID issues, we'll be back again this summer. Right. Okay. Well, good luck with that. I hope that all works out and you get to do that. <laughs> yeah. I know. Hey, these things, everything's getting mixed up with our plans. <laughs> yeah. So do you go to the match when you go over? Um, that is the plan. We did do the tour. Yeah. In March, we took, we went and saw, went through the whole stadium and everything like that. And Chris and my brother two years ago flew over just for a weekend to watch one of the matches as well. So he goes over a lot more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So he's, he's still a hardcore fan, even though he's so far away. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We've got DAZN and every and phone and computer and iPad available. <laughs> Yesterday he had to pick up one of our kids is in high school and so he had to pick her up during the match. So he was there had gone to penalty shootouts, right? And he oh, was last night. Last night's game, yeah. So he was going up the hill. It's the escarpment where by where we live and he lost connection right on the on the <laughs> yeah. So one minute they were tied up. Liverpool was in the lead. And then he found out they were tied, and then they found out it was over. And he's like, maybe it was a good thing I had lost connection. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Maybe it was a sign. That's just such a shame because up until that moment, we were going great, really oh, looking good. And I think. A little bit. <laughs> yeah. So tell me how the writing started then. So uh, I started writing about 10, 11 years ago. My degree is in kinesiology and nutrition. So I have a completely, it's more sport related. And my dad got cancer, and just a little bit after he died, uh, well, just before he died, actually, he had said something to me that kind of stuck with me. He was he was almost 70, and he had said, you know, do what you want in life. It goes by way too fast. Like, don't, don't chase, like, chase after what you want to do. And it kind of stuck with me, and after he had passed, he had passed in September, and that Christmas time, I had said to my husband, I said, I'm going to write a book. I, I don't have any plans. I'm not going to publish or anything. I just, it's something that I've kind of always wanted to do and I'm going to, I'm going to do it. So I did. And I had joined a critique group online because I thought if my kids ever read this, I don't want them to make fun of me. <laughs> and the, the group who I was with was saying, well, when are you, like, are you going to get this published? Who are you going to publish with? And I was like, oh, no, I'm not going to publish it. I have no plans. I just Oh, and what to was write. the book? What was the inspiration it was for the original? So it was the first book in the Chronicles of Kerrigan, which mm -hmm. is called Ray of Hope. Yeah. And there's actually now 40 books in that series. Wow. Yeah, like it's, I love the characters. Readers love the characters. I get to do spinoffs. These, the main characters have had kids that I get to write about, right? Like, there's only so much you can cut, but it's... Um, it's a fun series and that's kind of where it all started and I published it with a publishing company and the publishing company actually um, never paid me they took off with my royalties and I had no idea how it was doing I didn't know how popular the book was or how popular the series was and I had just said to my agent if I can get my rights back I'll try and self publish it well within the first week of me self publishing I sold like 40,000 copies wow. so it I was like, okay, maybe this is something that I should keep doing. And so I did part-time for about four years. And I we went away to Myrtle Beach in South Carolina on March break with the kids. 
And I said to my, we took the, I took the week off of, we had a business, a vintage jewelry business. And I had said to my husband, would you mind when we get back that I just write full time instead of going back to, with the jewelry? And I, I don't think I'd even finish the sentence. And he was like, I have been waiting for you to say this for, <laughs> Great. forever. Great. That's kind of how it started. And um, it just, it flourished. And then that series came out. And then I did a um, kind of like a, another fantasy series that's the Queen Alpha and the Omega Queen. It's kind of more of an Arthurian um Again, ironically set in England. I have this thing about England. <laughs> you have the best castles, apparently. Now I need to go to New Zealand, too. <laughs> and uh, that series took off. And then we were down in Florida on a holiday. We have a place down there. And this story of royal factions kind of came into my head. We had gone to take the kids to a resort, like a pool area there. And I grab my phone and I started typing like crazy and my husband's like who are you texting I'm like oh I'm not texting anybody I just have this story idea and I don't want to forget it I don't want to lose it and through that whole holiday I was constantly just taking notes and that's kind of how this the whole idea behind Royal Factions just came out I just was like I'd heard it you know with um there's so much with child abduction and um you know black marketing with children and all that and I kind of it just kept sticking with me and that's kind of how the whole royal factions I was like what happens if this was okay like what happens if it lasted long enough that people said all right if your child disappears your child disappears and they do nothing about it and they think they can do nothing about it so that's kind of how royal factions started and the price for peace came out <laughs> Well, the price for peace is out now. I've done the first three, so I know yeah. where it starts to head. Yeah. So that that original idea of, well, it's almost like a really dark Pied Piper thing, isn't it? Like, it the, is. you know, they go and round up all the young people. Um, Elise is sixteen in the in the first book. They round them all up and and just take them out of their normal lives, and they're they've got reasonably simple lives on farms and in villages and they're taken to this 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 palace um to live with the royalty and become part of that system where did the idea come from then a apart from the child abduction part of it uh, wh why why this royal this this kingdom but it's not set it's set like kind of in the present isn't it but because there's like there's like vehicles and stuff like that are abandoned and whatever just just talk me through that well, the setting kind of came out of the idea, like I said, like if people just start accepting this. And in a sense, this palace represents um, almost like the upper class, not like we give them the title in the book royalty, but it's like, you know, all these millionaires and billionaires, they consider themselves royalty and that they're above the law. Yeah. So that's kind of how the idea between this city kind of came up. And of course, we need this. We need a ruler and we need someone who we kind of don't like and someone who we want to try and like but you just can't help but hate them <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I have that too there's always characters who i think oh can we redeem them do they have redeeming qualities will this be a story of redemption or forgiveness or is it just past that point <laughs> so, so where I'm are you at sure. where are you at then with the prince because he's he's pretty on the line isn't he he is. He's walking like that that fine line of a very tall tower, right? Like, will he fall on the on the wall side or on the on the safe side, right? So he's still up in the air. You'll learn more as a, as the story. Okay, progresses. because as far as he goes, he's not to blame. He was born into this system. Yes. But he seems to have made the most of it as well. You know. Yeah. And, but he's also got a bad history, right? Like he's gone in and attacked towns and countries and areas that yeah. simply because he wanted their resources or he, you know what I mean? Or he didn't like the way they reacted to a proclamation. So I'll decimate you. Yeah. Right? It's, kinda, it's, it's, it's almost scary, but it's kind of like how the world thinks these days. You know, I don't like what you're doing. I'm going to decimate you or you're a country with not a well you're you're a poor country so you must have no knowledge so I'm going to take your resources and pretend to offer you something yeah right so we'll take your children and they should appreciate that we're taking them and what the opportunity we're giving them right all yeah. at a price 
all at a price. <laughs> yeah. So it is. It's about an abuse of power, then an abuse of position. It is. It's really yeah. what it's about. So, and you'll learn through the story um, how, what can, where things have to change, and how in society how things have to change. And there's little, little, lots of flowers that kind of start to get planted and grow that you'll start seeing throughout the story. I mean, I can see it because I, I get to set it all up and organize it, and I've got this beautiful plot line of all what's going to happen in six books. And now I'm like, does it need to have twelve? <laughs> oh, really? Oh, I'm a sucker. I can never stop. I always want these characters to keep going. <laughs> now, there is one character, and I hate to admit it, but because he's terrible, he's awful, but he's the one I enjoy reading the most. I know exactly who it is. He's the commander, and he is so... He's evil. The yeah. man is evil, but he is so much fun to play. <laughs> yeah, because you don't play him every day, right? So yeah. You get to voice and yeah the first time I heard you read his part I, I had shivers I was like <laughs> oh I don't like this guy <laughs> not you but the, the character oh he's you, horrible yeah you really got him like you really understood where his his um like there's a guy who's taking power he has no money kind of thing but he's taking power and is abusing it right yeah like oh he, yeah yeah and lives for that that power and to make people feel small and and a lot of people like that or characters like that in books you kind of think you've worked them out and you've found their level of evil and i think it's by the third book he takes it up a, a notch further and gets yeah. even worse i well, mean he's got no shame like there's no no um sense of morality like his moral compass is broken yeah <laughs> so where did the idea for him come from just again same thing when you look at well i won't say who i think in my head because i don't want to upset anybody <laughs> is it a politician but possibly yes <laughs> <laughs> we won't name it no name, let's not let's not but just the moral compass and the i mean and then of course he's over dramatized as a character in the story like yeah. who i think of and who he is are two different people completely but sure just absolutely like with him with Remy right like that's just that's a power thing right like that's control and to try yeah. and destroy someone to make yeah. them feel like they're absolutely nothing and you know what I think with him anyone who who tries to escape or who who dies or who who ends their life because of the situation he does not feel bad like to him it's almost like he's putting another notch on the wall got another one kind of feel yeah like I just I know. I don't like him. <laughs> no, and the the thing that really hurts is that he's nasty to people that you kind of like in the book. Like you mentioned Remy, who yeah. is just a terrific guy. And I made him... I don't know what you thought of when you wrote him, but when I, when I read him, I read him... I thought he was very working class, you know, because of his background that you described, yeah. uh, you know, in mines and, and stuff. So I made him Yorkshire because... Uh, <laughs> Because, because you know, it said that he, he worked in mines and I thought of mining communities and I could either go Yorkshire or Welsh and I decided to go Yorkshire just to try and get that across because he's such a sweet guy. He's and great. Then, yeah. Him and Will, like the two of them. Like yeah. imagine the leaders. Like the good things that would happen, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's well, a good idea. I need to start writing this down as well. <laughs> what, what do you mean? Why write what down? Some new plot changing here. We're talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, but turn turn uh, turn Re uh, Remy and Will into leaders. Yeah. Well, it, it could happen, and I kept thinking that that they were going to there was going to be some big rebellion, and I don't know whether there is going to be one. And I I started think, and then you know there is something that I don't want to give too much away because it's such a great yeah. story. But there is something that you think, oh yeah, well things are going to change now, and it totally backfires. Oh, yeah. And oh wow, it, the brutality of the, the the punishment that that is handed out just, and everybody accepts it. That's the scary thing. Is the oh, yeah. is the society on, accept it? And yeah, like that. Go on like nothing's happened, right? Like drag the person away and let's continue our lunch. Let's go. Yeah. Right? Like oh yeah. So yeah, something has to change. 
Like it's, you can feel it, especially at the end of the third book, you can feel that there is um, some serious, serious consequences of what's going to happen. So yeah, the fourth book, I'm halfway through that now. And there's, yeah, you'll, you'll enjoy it when you start. <laughs> well, the first one is out and I'm guessing it's selling well because it is a terrific book. Uh, sorry, audio book. You'll know it as a, as, as it a, is the, the ebooks are out too. The audio book, the second book should almost be done. And our third book should almost be out as well. Um, the fourth book will actually, it's up for pre-order now in ebook and paperback. And then by the time it releases, you'll pretty much probably be ready to, the audio book will start to release as well. We'll be pretty close on time on that. So it's great. I have been for my audio. I took a break on doing audio and I'm glad I did because had I not we wouldn't have bumped into each other really um, why is that yeah I just was focusing on writing and I really didn't think I had time to, for the marketing and for pushing with audio and I just I've had readers constantly saying why you know why aren't you going faster with your audio books and I just like I don't I don't have time I'm busy with the kids you know family first then writing and then with COVID we were home and I'm like Pe what are people going to do right now like a lot of people were, we were basically three months housebound, right? Yeah. And uh, I mean, in Canada, some of us, we still are, and our numbers are very low. And uh, so I just said, I'm going to start working on my audiobooks. There was codes I could give out. So I started giving out codes. And then I was like, that's it. I'm back into it. I'm back into it. I can do this for two hours a day and get caught up. And I'm so glad I did because, yeah, you and I wouldn't have bumped into each other. It's, it's fantastic. You're the perfect voice. Like I couldn't imagine anybody else for. Well, thank the world. you for that because I've really, really. It's such an honor to any or to have any author's work to be entrusted to me. I've I always there's always pressure. I think I'm, I'm saying to my wife. I said I've just done a thing for another chapter for a one eater, and I tried this, and I I really hope she likes it. And then I send it through, and then she didn't say anything. So it must be okay. And like. The, <laughs> it, it, because it's still reasonably new to me. You know, I only started doing audio books in May. And oh, okay. so, yeah, I was uh, I was a radio presenter and I was running a radio station in London. And just before COVID, I was let go and then COVID happened. And so it was quite obvious I wasn't going to get a job in a radio station for a little while. I thought, well, I got to do something. And then I I thought I'd try these audio books. And these have just been terrific, just been lovely to do. Yeah, they're a fun story. I'm glad that you've enjoyed it. You've definitely found your niche like you with <laughs> like new adult and fantasy and that you've got great voice. Like it's, it's really enjoyable to listen to. Like I'm listening to it and then I'm like, this is such a great story. Like, this is so good. And then I'm like, Oh wait, I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Storytelling feels so real. Like you can imagine what's going on as you're reading it, which, uh, that's a gift for, for narrators. If they can bring the story to life, that isn't just reading a story that, you know, like if I'm out walking and I've got my, airpods in and i can listen to the story and i'll be like no and the people around the dog starts barking i'm like oh no no it's okay you know? well i see it when i'm when i'm reading it i see it i see it all in vivid color and and uh and and if it's someone horrible like the commander i'm really giving it that what the neighbors must think i don't know because this is <laughs> this is my wardrobe or what you would call a closet i suppose yeah and uh sometimes when i get really into it i think the neighbors must think we've gone crazy but uh oh it's it's <laughs> it's yeah it's so it's so good um so it's called it's royal factions the series and book yeah. one is out now as an audio book and yeah. the book one is called the price for peace and if you're watching this then click on below there'll be a link that you can click on and if you click on that it'll take you to the book on audible and you'll be able to click on there. And if you sign up for 30 days for Audible trial, which is free, you can yeah. download the book for free. So yeah. you've got nothing to lose. And no, these sure. are and they, great they, stories. Message us and let us know. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll leave a comment in the in the thing yeah. and tell us what you think of it. And uh, sure. yeah. So you've, you've got to do that. It's great. So Juanita or W.J. May which is your official title as, yes. as an author. Yes, it sounds a lot easier to say than Juanita. <laughs> Watch the blonde Juanitas you'll probably ever meet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is, uh, so I've switched from, from being a radio presenter to being an audiobook narrator. Yeah. 
you've switched from being a champion athlete and record-breaking high jumper to being a world famous author hey what's next yeah who knows we'll have to do a movie together no. <laughs> you could be the narrator voice in the movie i'm not being in it <laughs> Juanita, thank you so much. Thank you, too.